Hello, Mr. President. Thank you very much for providing Fox News with this opportunity for an interview. I'm joined here by my colleague, re reporter Greg Palcott, and uh, we're very interested in proceeding. Uh, as you know, there's been a number of breaking news stories uh, which uh, we need to discuss with you. The UN has just released its chemical weapon report. Uh, my colleague, uh, Greg Palcott, will be discussing that with you in a moment. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, other major developments regarding the chemical weapons plan, uh, which has been agreed to by the U.S. and the Russian government. Uh, do you agree with this plan to secure uh, and to eventually destroy the chemical weapons? Uh, last week, we uh, joined uh, the international agreement of preventing the uh, WMD, uh, chemical WMD. Uh, and part of this agreement, the main part, is to not to uh, manufacture these armaments, uh, not to store, and not to use, and of course not to distribute. Uh, and part of it is to get rid of those uh, materials, the chemical uh, materials. So of course when we, uh, when we are part now of this agreement, we have to agree on that chapter. You have to agree on? on getting rid of all these armed, I mean, to destroy. Uh, why, to destroy do you, why do you agree now? Uh, no, actually, it's not now. If you go back uh, 10 years ago, uh, when we were a uh, non-permanent member of the, United, uh, of the Security Council in 2003, uh, we proposed to the United Nations to Security Council, Syrian proposal is to get rid of the WMD from the Middle East to have a free uh, chemical free zone or WMD free zone in the Middle East. And actually the United States opposed that proposal. So as conviction, we wanted to see our region free of WMD, all kind of WMD because it's very volatile region. It's uh, always uh, on the verge of uh, anarchy and uh, wars. So that's why we, do, we cannot say that we agreed now. Well, we, we, we know that uh, President Obama and Secretary Kerry have said in the past that you were lying. Now, that's their words, not mine, uh, when you said that you didn't have any chemical weapons. A few days ago in an interview with Russia Channel 24, uh, you admitted you had chemical weapons stockpiles. Uh, now, I, I just want to make sure we're clear here before we go forward. Uh, do you or do you not have chemical weapons? Uh, first of all, regarding what Obama and Kerry said, I dare them to say that we said no once. We never said it. You, n you uh, never said no. No, no. We never well, said. We never tell said. Us now. We never said no. We never said yes. Can we you always say, say yeah? But we always say it's classified issue. We don't have to discuss it. And if we want to talk about it, we say if. And if means you can, you may have it, you may not. So this is blatant uh, lie. Okay, but can you tell us now? Do you have chemical weapons or don't you? Of course, when we uh, joined the. Uh, when we joined the treaty last week, it means that we have, and we said, we said that. So it's not a secret anymore. So, so as far as the American people, you, you, you will uh, agree that you do have a stockpile of chemical weapons? Of course, that's why we joined the international agreement, in order to get rid of these. Now, my, my colleagues, uh, my former colleagues on Capitol Hill are kind of skeptical about your agreement with this plan. Uh, they say it's just a stalling tactic. Is it? A stalling tactic, well, what's it, to join the agreement? But yeah, that you're just stalling right now for time, that you really don't have any intention of going along with the plan. Are you stalling? When you join the agreement, you have mechanism, and you have to obey these mechanisms. And according to the history of Syria, we never made agreement with any party in this world, and we didn't fulfill uh, what we have to do, so, our, our role in that agreement, so, never. So, so you would say uh, that President Obama then can trust you to follow through? Uh, I don't think that President Obama should trust me first. The Syrian people should trust me, not President Obama. That's uh, okay. second. When you talk about agreements and international relations, you have mechanisms. And those mechanisms should be based on uh, objective criteria. So if you want to trust or not trust, watch this country, see if they obey those mechanisms and those rules or not. This is where you can trust him or not. So it's not personal relation. I understand. So you. You're under a tight time deadline. Are you going to be able to provide the list that is part of the agreement? Exactly. The list of chemical it weapons? is part. Uh, you should provide a list of uh, the arsenal that you have 
to the organization of the chemical weapons. And, and are you and are you open? Are you ready to open chemical weapons sites to international inspection? We didn't say that we we are joining uh, partially that agreement or that organization. We joined fully. We send the letter. We send the documents, and we are committed to the full requirements of this agreement. Well, as a, as a are you, would you be from. Would you be ready to let our Fox News cameras uh, have access to some of the chemical weapons site so that the American people will be able to see for themselves? Is that possible? Uh, in Syria, we have institutions, we have rules, we have conditions. So we have to go back to this institution to ask them for that request. And after they uh, study the, the request, they can uh, say yes or not. But it's not about the president to take that decision alone. So we have institution. You can do that after the, this interview. You can ask for the permission. Can, can you just destroy these chemical weapons uh, quickly? And if not, why not? I think it's a very complicated operation technically. And it needs a lot, a lot of money. Some estimated about a billion for the Syrian stockpile. We're not experts in that regard. But that's the estimates that we've had uh, recently. Uh, so quickly depends. That you have to ask the experts, what do they mean by quickly? because it has certain schedule. It needs a year, maybe a little bit less or a little bit more. So well, what since, do you mean by quickly? Since it, since it is the United States which demanded uh, that you give up chemical weapons, would you be prepared uh, to turn over your chemical weapons to the U.S. government for the purposes of safely destroying those weapons? Uh, as I said, it, uh, it needs a lot of money. It needs about one billion. Uh, it's very detrimental to the environment. Uh, if uh, the American administration is ready to pay those money and uh, to take the responsibility of bringing toxic materials to the United States, why don't they do it? But of course, it's going to be in cooperation with the specified organization in but, the United but, but Nations. But you're prepared to hand them over at some point for the safe destruction of them? It doesn't matter where, as I said, at the end, if you're going to destroy them, it doesn't matter where they go. Are there any conditions? No, we don't have any condition to send it anywhere. And then if it's going to be destroyed, it could be destroyed anywhere. It's, as I said, it's very detrimental to the environment. So it, whoever country is ready to take the risk of those materials, let them take it. I just have one final question before I give it over to my colleague, reporter Greg. Do you have a security agreement with the Russian government that if and when you give up your chemical weapons, that you, in fact, uh, will be protected so that you're not vulnerable to attacks yeah. uh, because we know there are other nations which gave up their weapons and then they were attacked. You know, the uh, Russian role politically was very efficient during the crisis in Syria during the last two years and a half. And they vetoed three times in the Security Council. So actually, they protected Syria politically. They don't have to have a uh, security agreement with Syria regarding this. It's not about uh, only about uh, the, uh, the army and the war. It's about politics, first of all. So I think they are doing their job without having this agreement. So, you, so just to summarize, you do have uh, chemical weapons. You're prepared to go along with the plan to, uh, uh, to destroy them and that you're prepared to, uh, uh, to cooperate with the international community in that. Again, as I said, the, what, what you mentioned, all are part of the international agreement. And when we agree, agreed to uh, join this agreement, we want to fully cooperate with this agreement, not partially. I think this is very clear. Greg. All right, thank you, Dennis. Mr. President, this is so important. Let me just follow up on just one or two points and then move on. Again, no conditions. You will agree to this plan to destroy your chemical weapons. You had put conditions on this in the past, in the past week or so, but no conditions. The only condition that the agreement will entail and propose and provide. Okay. So now we are going to discuss the details with, this inter with the international uh, organization. So I don't have all the details to discuss it with you now. And I'm not the expert to have uh, specialized people to discuss the details. But in general, as headlines, whenever we join agreement see, as Syria, we are always committed to those agreements. Your problem was that there was a threat of force coming from the United States. There's still discussion of the so-called Chapter 7 resolution uh, being put forward to the UN, which would in include the possibility of force. Would that be a deal breaker for you if that went forward? 
What was the deal breaker? Chapter 7 resolution in the UN, which allows uh, bodies in the UN to use force if you are not complying. Yeah, there's misunderstanding that we uh, agreed upon this uh, agreement because of the th American threat. Actually, if you go back before the G20, before the proposal of this initiative, the Russian initiative, the American threat wasn't about giving, uh, handing over the chemical arsenal. It was about attacking Syria in order not to use the arsenal again. So it's not about the threat. Syria never obeyed any threat. Actually, we responded to the, American, to the Russian initiative and to our need and to our conviction. So whether they have Chapter 7 or don't have Chapter 7, this is politics between the great countries. So that's irrelevant to no, you? No, no, irrelevant. No, no. We obey because we want to obey. We have uh, completely different uh, incentives. And again, that time frame, which Dennis mentioned, one week to come up with a full accounting of your chemical weapons, November for the first inspectors to come in, mid-2014 for all your chemical weapons to be destroyed. That's an ambitious uh, timetable, even by expert standards, but you, you think that is doable? Yeah, but we have to discuss it, to discuss these details with the organization first. So you have to discuss Second, that first. Yeah, this is first. Second, the time is not our problem. It's the problem of the organization. How much time do they need? to implement these agreements. So you don't because, necessarily sign on no, to no. that time. The only table. thing that we have to do is to provide the information and to, to make them accessible to our sites, which is not a problem. Oh, we can do it tomorrow. We don't have any problem. You could do so, it tomorrow. Yeah, of course, we don't have a problem. The problem is how much fast they can be in getting rid of any chemical matter. Because this is a very complicated situation. It's not, uh, it's not about will. It's about techniques. So only experts can answer your questions. Which leads me to my last question on Dennis's topic, and that is, that's exactly what some people are saying, that this is just a, a ruse, just, just, just a game, because it is so difficult. Experts say it will be so difficult to get rid of these chemical weapons, especially in a war situation like this. This is indeed buying you a lot of time. Even if you don't have war, it is difficult. Even if you have all the requirements uh, afforded by every party, it takes time to get rid of. So you're matters. saying this could take years? As, 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 as I said, we don't have exper experience in that regard, but some say it takes one year. I didn't say years. Uh, as I heard, it takes about one year, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more. Thank you, Mr. But President. But at the end, we have to, to, to see uh, the expert, and they will tell us. Okay. Let's go on to the latest breaking news. There's a lot of breaking news in this region right now, and that's the just-released UN report on the chemical weapon attack last month in the outskirts of Damascus right yeah. now. Uh, according to this report, and this is the report you said you were waiting for. Yeah. You said you didn't want to hear the U.S., you didn't want to hear U.K., you didn't want to hear France, you want the U.N. to speak. Mm -hmm. And they have spoken, and they have said, and I quote, there is clear and convincing evidence that the nerve gas sarin has been used. Mm -hmm. And they base this on environmental, chemical, medical samples. They say that killing happened on a relatively large scale. That killing included children. Do you agree with this assessment? Uh, they have the samples, and uh, they are supposed to be objective. We, uh, we didn't have any uh, formal uh, report. Uh, but uh, the question, if I agree about the use of sarin gas... Now, do you agree with the assessment that a chemical weapon attack occurred on the outskirts of Damascus on August 21st. That's the information that we have, but dif information is different from evident. It's different? Yeah, it's different. So you disagree with the UN report? No, no, I don't disagree. You have to wait till you have evidence. You can agree and disagree when you have the evidence. You should they have, have the evidence. They've interviewed uh, 40, 50 people on the ground. Yeah, yeah we have to discuss caregivers. the evidence with them. They have to, we have to discuss it with them because they are going back. They haven't finished their mission yet. They are going back, and we have to discuss it with them. We have to see the details, but we cannot disagree without having the opposite evidence. So nobody said that it's not used, because in March, we invited the well, uh, delegation to Syria because the sarin gas was used in March. We had the evidence that it was used in March. And we'll get into in that Aleppo. in a second. I want so to ask you when about I talk that. as official, I can talk about the evidence that I have. OK, but, but, but they put out a 38-page report. I mean, it's been posted since yesterday. I don't know whether you've had no, a no, chance to yet. look no. at it. We have to, we have to look at it. We have to discuss it before saying, uh, we Whether they are correct or not. Yeah, okay. it's, it's only yesterday evening. Let's, let's go hypothetical then. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has said that this is, in fact, a war crime, that it is despicable, 
that it is a grave violation of international law. If that event happened, as they are saying it did happen, would it be despicable? Would it be a violation of international law? That's self-evident, of course. Self-evident? Of course, that's self-evident. It is, a, is it despicable. It's a crime. Because I'm sure you have seen the videos that we have seen of the, yeah, of the you, child you, yeah, but no one, gagging on the ground, or the people no one has on, verified the, on the floor. The, the, the credibility of the videos and the pictures. Exactly. No one verified. The only verified things are the samples that the delegation go and took, samples of blood, and other things from the soil and so on. Which is what they say they yeah, have. Yeah, but you cannot build a report on videos if, if it's not verified. But they are basing it on the blood samples. Especially as we live in a world of forgery for the last two years and a half regarding Syria. We have a lot of forgery on the internet. Now there's a, a last key element to this UN report. And while the UN inspectors did not lay blame, that is they did not place culpability for the attack, there are many experts interpreting this report, some that I've spoken to in the last 12 hours, that frankly say this attack looks firmly like an attack coming from your government, from the Syrian government. Hmm. They point to a few things. They say it was a large amount of gas, hmm. sarin gas, maybe as much as a ton. The rebels could not have had that. Hmm. They say the type of rocket, an M14 artillery, a 330 millimeter, never used by the rebels before, that they needed large vehicles to send these rockets up. The rebels don't have that. And maybe most importantly, they point to the trajectory of the rockets. They say that they were able to trace the rockets back from the impact point hmm. to where they came from. And in two different occasions, this is according to the UN, they say that the start point was Quezon Mountain, the headquarters mm -hmm. of the Republican Guard. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Uh, everything you mentioned is part of the report. Excuse me, sir? Everything you mentioned, all these points, are part of the report? These points are all part, of the, all part of the report. These okay. are all facts. No, the, the report didn't mention anything regarding the Republican Guards or things like this. They said the, they gave the azimuth tracking of the trajectory, uh -huh. and people have extrapolated from the azimuth track that yeah. that is where it was coming from, northwestern Dam Damascus. Yeah. First of all, the sarin gas called the kitchen gas. Do you know why? Because anyone can make sarin in his house. They said it's very high quality, higher quality than even used in Iraq by uh, Saddam Hussein, your neighbor at the time. The, first of all, any rebel can make sarin. Second, we know that all those rebels are supported by governments. So any government that would have such chemical material can can be can hand it over to those. The experts say that they've seen they've tracked nothing like this. It's a ton of sarin gas. It is launchers. It is rockets. It, it's a whole fleet, which happen to be, from time to time, those kinds of armaments, those kind of munitions happen to be in your bases. No, no. This is uh, realistically cannot be possible. You cannot use the sarin beside your troops. This is first. Second, you cannot use you don't use WMD while you're advancing. You're not being defeated. You're not retreating. The, the whole situation was in favor of the army. This is second. Third, we didn't use it when we had pro bigger problems uh, last year. Third, when they talk about any troop or any unit in the Syrian army that's used these kind of weapons, this is false for one reason, because chemical weapons can only be used by specialized units. It cannot be used by any other units like infantry or, or similar traditional uh, units. So all what you've mentioned is not realistic and not true. Uh, definitely, so far as government, we have evidence that the uh, terrorist groups have used uh, sarin gas and those evidences, those evidence handed over to the uh, Russians. Just, so, yeah. this just is second. The Russian uh, satellites, since the beginning of these allegations at the 21st of August, they said that they have information through their satellites that the rocket launched from another uh, area. So why to ignore this uh, point of view? So the whole story doesn't even hold together. It's not realistic. So no, we didn't. Uh, in one world, we didn't use any chemical weapons in the Ghouta because if you want to use it, you would ha harm your uh, troops, you would have harmed the 
tens of thousands of civilians living in, Syria, in Damascus. Just to conclude this portion, Mr. President, uh, will you allow more investigation? Will you allow a UN investigators to come in, yeah. maybe to further investigate this attack? As you say, other attacks, there's something like 14 different attacks uh, where accusations are being made on both sides, and even uh, a UN team to decide on the culpability, the blame for this attack. You will allow those UN teams to come in. We invited them to come to Syria first in March, and we We've been asking them to come back to Syria to continue their investigations because we have more places to be investigated. The United States is the one who made pressure for them to leave recently before they finish their missions. When we invited the delegation, we wanted this delegation to have full authority to investigate everything, not only the use of the sarin or the gas or the chemical weapons, but to investigate everything about who did it and how. But the United States make pressure in order to keep it only by was it used or not, why? Because I think the United States administration thought that if they are going to investigate who and how, they're going to, the con to, to reach the conclusions that the rebels or the terrorists have used it and Thank not you. vice versa. Thank you, Mr. President. Dennis. Do, do you believe that uh, mm -hmm. Syria's position Syria, as yeah. a secular state could be at risk in this conflict. Okay. Of course, when we have this kind of extremism and terrorism and violence, that will render the whole society uh, into a uh, more uh, closed society, more uh, ideologically uh, uh, fanatic. And that's what they are doing. That's what the extremists are doing. But, but what does it mean to have a secular state? I mean, there are questions about whether or not, you know, your position is authoritarian, whether you believe in democratic values. What does a secular state mean to Syria? A secular state means to deal with, their, with its citizen, regardless of their uh, religion, sex, and ethnicity. Because Syria is a melting, melting pot. We have tens of different cultures in Syria. If we don't have secular uh, states, that reflect this secular society, Syria will disintegrate. So that's what it means, secular society. Well, it, one of the uh, notions about this uh, very serious conflict is that it's a civil war. Uh, would you agree with that characterization that no. you're, you're in, involved in a civil no. war? Civil war should start from the society, should start from within. Civil war needs... So you're blaming outside interests. It needs the clear lines geographical lines and social lines and sectarian lines that we don't have in Syria. We don't have these lines. Sectarian war, or sorry, civil war, doesn't mean to have 80 or 83 nationality coming to fight within your country supported by foreign countries. What we have is not civil war, what we have is war, but it's a new kind of war. So, um you're blaming outside interests then for the acceleration of war. Now, uh, there's just some statistics that have come out from IS, uh, um, IHS James. They're a defense analyst group. They estimate the opposition as 100,000, 30,000 of which are hardline Islamists sympathetic uh, uh, to the 10,000 Al-Qaeda-inspired jihadists. Uh, now, any of these Syrian, are they, are they all outsiders? Where are they getting their money? First of all, no one has this precise number. This is exaggeration because most of the jihadists, when they come to Syria, they don't come through countries and they don't come through uh, organizations. They just come by plane to neighboring countries and they cross the border like any other one and they just want to come to Syria to, for the jihad, for the other jihadists. So nobody has these numbers. We know that we have tens of thousands of jihadists, but we are on the ground, we live in this country, what I can tell you that 80, and some say is 90, is, is difficult to be, to be precise. We don't have clear data and uh, precise data. 80 to 90 percent of the rebels on the ground of the terrorists are Al-Qaeda and their offshoots. These are the rebels? Yeah. But, but, but you're not, terrorists. you are not maintaining that all of your opponents are jihadis, are you? No, 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 not all of them. Of course, you have so many other different, but they are small, they are, they, are, they are becoming minority. At the very beginning, the jihadists were the minority. In, at the end of 2012, and during this year, they became the majority with the flow of tens of thousands from different countries. Where are they getting their money from? 
Can you tell us right now? Uh, mainly from donations. But where? For donations from, from where? Everywhere Can you name nations that are donated? The, in the Islamic world. No, 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 they come from individuals, not from countries, mainly. Those are Qaeda. We don't know if some countries support them directly. We don't know. We don't have any information. I have to be very precise. But mainly from donations from people who uh, carry the same ideology in their minds. You mentioned before that some figures that are given are exaggeration. Can you tell us now how many Syrians have actually died in this conflict? We have tens of thousands of Syrians that have died, mainly because of the terrorist attacks, assassinations, and suicide bombers, the majority. And, and uh, how many are your government soldiers? More than uh, 15,000. And how many are insurgents? How many, no, how many uh, insurgents are jihadis? Uh, we don't have numbers because we, don't, we, we, we cannot count them. So, uh. um, well, there, but there are, there are innocent people being killed in this. And, and you're, you're, the reports are that your government has bombed uh, villages in which innocent people are killed. Um, what about that, Mr. President? What about, what, uh, what about the innocent what people about this? who are killed yeah. by the Syrian forces? The majority of the innocent people have been killed by the terrorists, not by the government. You cannot, not, 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 the, not the government, a wise government in the world that would kill its own people. How can you withstand if you kill your own people for two years and a half, while the West is against you, the regional country, many of them are against you, and your people are against you while you're killing them? Is it possible? Is it realistic? So, so you're, saying you're, not, you're saying you're not killing your own people, but your, your forces have, have launched attacks on villages where your own people have been killed. No, actually what you're talking about is when the terrorists uh, infiltrating residential area in villages and sometimes uh, in the suburbs of the cities and within uh, large cities and the army has to go there to get rid of those terrorists. It can, uh, the army should defend the civilians, not the opposite. It, you cannot leave them free killing the people and assassinating the people and behaving the people and eating their heart while you say, when you go to defend them you say that you are, you are killing your own people. You don't. But in every war you have casualties. This is war. You don't have a clean war. You don't have soft war. You don't have good war. That's the, 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 the international community reports that Syrian rebel forces opposed to you are equally, if not more, worried now about jihadi fighters than they were, than they, than they were previously about your government. Now, in this, in this new development, is there an opening for you to achieve a rapprochement with your Syrian opponents? Yeah, here we have to differentiate between what you call opposition and the terrorist. Opposition is a political meaning, it's a political term. When you oppose somebody, like in your country, in any other country in the world, you have your own program, you have your own vision, uh, you have your own grassroots, and you go, you propose whatever you want regarding the political system or anything else, and you can change that system if you oppose the other party. Opposition doesn't mean to carry weapons and kill people, kill innocents, and to destroy schools, to destroy infrastructure, and to behave. What's the relation between opposition and behaving? Well, well, let me then, as a follow-up, ask you about diplomacy. Mm. Uh, what diplomatic moves are you prepared to make as confidence-building measures towards peace in your country? Any diplomatic move without having stability and getting rid of the terrorists is going to be illusional, just an illusion. So. Any diplomatic move should start with stopping the flow of the terrorists, the logistical support of those terrorists, the armament support, and the money support. Then you have full plan. The Syrian could sit on the table, discuss the future of Syria, the political system, the constitution, the institution, everything. Would that, would that future include negotiations uh, with uh, the Syrian opposition? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, but, I, but that doesn't mean negotiating with the terrorists. I understand that. Yeah. Now, but does it mean that you're ready for, let's say, a program of reconciliation with those who have opposed you? Uh, with, uh, are you ready for that? Of course, we announced it at the beginning of this year. We uh, said we, can, we are ready to discuss with any political party in Syria, inside Syria and outside Syria. Let's take this down the road into next year. Would you be prepared to offer amnesty to all the Syrians who opposed your government? Uh, they're not, uh, they didn't breach the law. So if they oppose the government, they can come to Syria without amnesty. 
only amnesty should be offered to anyone who uh, violates the Syrian law or breaches the law. I mean, if you oppose it, it's not crime. We have opposition okay, within Syria. You, but do you believe in amnesty as a, as a path towards peace? Yeah, that depends on to whom. If it's uh, to whom they uh, stain their hands with the Syrian blood, it, it could be as part of uh, national reconciliation. Uh, would, that, that, would, that, would that include reparations to the families of, of, of those who were killed? Yeah, that, that, uh, that, I mean, uh, it's not the president who should put all these details. I think the, the Syrian uh, meeting uh, of every faction or all the parties that could define all these details. What would you say, uh, Mr. President, to the millions of Syrians who are now refugees uh, as you move towards a peace process? Are you, what, what will you do to say, please come home? Of course, we want them to come, to come back to their villages, to their cities, to their houses, to their homes. We want them to. But uh, we have to help them with uh, getting rid of the terrorists because the majority of those refugees left because of the terrorists, not because of the government. Actually, we have refugees within Syria that's been helped uh, by the government. Be, well, let, let, let me ask you this. Um, have you spoken to President Obama? Never. Have you ever spoken to him? Never. Uh, are you interested in speaking to our president? That depends on the content. <laughs> it's not a chat. <laughs> If you wanted to send him a message right now, what would you say to him? Listen to, the, to your people. Follow the common sense of your people. That's enough. And um, Pope Francis instructed the international community to lay aside the futile pursuit of a military solution. Do you believe the Pope's advice is valid uh, for your government as well as other countries? Uh, of course, we, we, uh, we invited uh, every, Syria, every militant in Syria to give up its armament and we offered amnesty to wh whoever lay down his armament and wants to go back to his normal life, to his normality as Syrian citizen. Of course, we believe in that. Thank you. Now, before I give this back to my colleague, uh, reporter Greg Palcott, I, I want to ask you a question that's been bothering me and perhaps other Americans. Um, not everyone who is watching this interview today knows that uh, you're a doctor, you're, you're an MD, uh, and you've done this before you were president. Uh, as you know, doctors take an oath uh, never to do harm to anyone. Mm. That's a direct quote from, uh, from the Hippocratic Oath. Um, does, a, does a doctor give that up when, uh, when he takes political office? Uh, first of all, doctors take the right decision to protect the life of the patient. So you cannot say that they don't do harm physically because sometimes they have to extra extract the bad member that could kill the patient. You could extract eye, you could extract leg, and so on. But you don't say that he's a bad doctor. It's still a humanitarian uh, job, whatever they do. The same for a politician, but in a larger scale. A doctor deal with one patient, the politician should deal with the public with millions or ten, ten of millions and so on. Uh, so the question is whether your decision should uh, help the life of the Syrians or not in such a situation. Nobody likes the violence. We are against the violence. But what will you do when the terrorists attack your country and kill the people? Would you say that I'm against violence or you defend? You have army, you have police, they have to do their job. This is the constitution and this is the role of any government. What did you do in, in Los Angeles in the, in the 90s when you have rebels? Didn't you send your army? You did. Greg. Exactly. So, so this is the mission of the government. The, 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 the most important thing is when you take the decision, whether it harms or not, it should help the majority of the people. It's better if you take the decision that could help everyone, but sometimes in certain circumstances, in difficult circumstances, you cannot. So you have to take the less harmful decision. Thank you, Mr. President. Greg? Mr. President, our time is limited, but I want to briefly go back in time a little bit. I was here in 2000 for the funeral of your father. You assumed the position of president, and at that time, some people had real hopes for you as, as a reformer to change things, to bring more democracy to this, to this country. In fact, however, critics and analysts said you pulled back. You pulled back to the point where 
Now you're being branded other things than reformer. You're branded a dictator and much, much worse. Hmm. How does that make you feel? How does it make you feel when people say you, to use the, an American parlance, you've lost the plot? That is, you've, you've lost the trail of what you might have done then that yeah. might have avoided all of this now. So first of all, if you want to talk about the hope, I will say I'm the hope of the Syrians. It doesn't matter if I'm the hope of any foreigner uh, person, whether he's official or any other one. Uh, so all the uh, terms that you've used in your question uh, should be referred to the Syrian to see whether they agreed upon these terms or not. Uh, at the end, it's not about the term, it's about the content. It doesn't matter what they, what they say, whether he's dictator or reformer. Today, you have propaganda. Do they say the same word about uh, their allies uh, in the Gulf states. Do they talk about the dictatorship in the Gulf state? Of We're talking not. about Syria. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I, I have the right to answer about uh, the other uh, regime or other states that they are much far from democracy than Sy the Syrian state. Going back to your question, the reform is not the job of of, uh, of certain person in a country, whether the president or the government or the people. The president and the government can lead the reform, but the reform is a social process. It's a social process, and it's influenced by many different things, including the external factors, whether you have a war, whether you have stability, whether you have better economic conditions, whether you have uh, very bad ideologies coming from abroad. So talking about the reform in our, the way that I presented at the very beginning, and I still believe the same, uh, concept and values and principle, you should have democracy that reflects our own traditions. But democracy is not a goal, it's a means to reach the prosperity. And democracy based on accepting the other. When you have a closed ideology and many taboos that prevent you from accepting the other, other cultures in your country, you are going backward. Doesn't matter what the president do in that regard. Not the constitution, not the law, not any other process can make the democracy real one, realistic one in, in such a society. Only when the society makes this democracy, you can talk about it. It's a culture. So I'm still a reformer. I still believe in the same values. But if you go back to the history of the last decades, the most complicated situations happening in our region, this is one of the reasons why the democracy, not in Syria, in the whole region, is going backward. We are going farther from democracy, not, uh, not closer. But again, to stay, to stay with your country and to stay with a little bit of recent history, yeah. move back just two and a half years ago this week, that was the first, that was the first protest uh, here in this country. Yeah. People said that was still a sign that people were unhappy, your own Syrian people, about your moves to democracy. And that was simply what they were asking for, more democracy, more reform. They weren't even asking for you to step down at yeah, that time. Right. Critics will say you moved in too hard, too fast, with tanks targeting protesters, uh, torturing, et cetera, et cetera. Th yeah. That is the critique of yours. And you, yeah. once again, yeah. missed another chance. Yeah. How do you feel about that let's, two and a half yeah, years let's, on? That's a very simple question. If you want to oppress those people because we don't accept their request, why did the president himself, I, I said in one of my speeches at the very, at the very beginning of the conflict, why did I have to say publicly that those people have legitimate demand? This is first. Second, if we are going to use the force, why did, you, why did we change the constitution? Why did we change the law? Why did we have now more than uh, uh, 15 uh, new parties in Syria, political party? Why did we change so many uh, laws that they asked for? Because we knew that it wasn't about democracy. If, you, if they asked for democracy, how did, how did they kill some of those people, I'm not talking about, I'm not generalizing. Some demonstrators uh, demonstrated for the reason that you've mentioned. But some others, they killed soldiers and they killed policemen in the first week of the conflict. What's the relation between asking for democracy and killing and assassinating? So we have to be very precise in differentiating between people who ask for democracy and uh, terrorists. This is first. Second, Part of those people who were opposing the government at the very beginning, today they support the government against the terrorists. Because they, don't, they ask for reform, but they didn't ask for terrorists. So you are talking about two different completely situations between the beginning of the conflict and 
today. So we're still moving forward in the path of the democracy. And part of the solution that I just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, when we sit around the table, the Syrian people will say, what the best constitution, what the best political system? Do they want that parliamentarian, presidential, quasi-presidential, and, and, and so on? So what laws do they want? Everything. So it's not the president who is going to set. If the people want to set up their new system, it's a democracy. But you bring up a, a point that leads to my next question. Some people will say that you have just waged a war of attrition. That is, that you have waited, waited and ground people down. And some of those that felt very peacefully that they wanted a change here in democracy, now, after two and a half years of fighting, they're willing to give in a little bit. And at the outset, you talked about uh, terrorists coming inside, and now you've allowed or you've created a situation on the ground because of this long period for the terrorists to come here. My point is, you're not really changing people's minds, you're just forcing them into this box, this box where we're two and a half years on, we're 110,000 people dead, cities in ruins, and you're hoping that your people will just surrender to the idea. I mean, is that really where you wanted to go with this whole thing? So the core of the idea that I invited, I created the atmosphere to invite terrorists to Syria. You held on long enough. You yeah. held on long enough against the demands of people who wanted peaceful demands yeah, no, From the very beginning, we accepted the demands. From the very beginning, you we accepted the demands. From the very beginning, before the terrorists, all those uh, foreigners coming to Syria, from the very beginning, in 2011, Few, two months after, the, the, uh, six days after the conflict, we said we were going to change. And we started the process uh, of changing the constitution two or three months after the beginning. And we had the vote. I mean, the peop I didn't change the constitution. The people voted, uh, or let's say there was a referendum, and the people voted in that referendum for this new constitution. In two th at the beginning of 2012, in February, before the end of one year of the conflict. So what you were saying is far cry from reality. It's a completely different story. It's, it's not known, known of these things happening in Syria. It's about maybe another country. What happened in Syria from the very beginning, we said we are ready. If there's any demand, we are ready to change everything. So what, what, what could the president do, or how could he succeed if the people are against him? How, how can he succeed? Just uh, you want to be president just for the sake of being president? That's not, uh, not realistic. It's impossible. Do your tactics in this war, do you back your tactics in this war? I mean, a year ago we stood in home, it's one of your great cities, and, and we watched as your artillery, which was lined up around the outskirts of the city, pound again and again, unrelentlessly, the center of the city. You say you're going for the enemy, you say you're going for the terrorists, but that, some will call it indiscriminate shelling, has left many, many civilians dead, and frankly has left that city and many of your other great cities, like, like Aleppo and others, in ruins. I mean, is, is this the way to go after, if you think there are some terrorists out there, the terrorist enemies of your state? So it's like if you say that when the terrorists infiltrated some area or attack certain part of any city, that the civilian, civilians would stay and live with them. That's impossible. Whenever the terrorists enter an area, the civilians would leave, unless they use them as a human shield. But in most of the cases, the civilians would quit their area because of the terrorists. And that's why you have so many refugees. So in most of the cases, the Syrian army attack area where there's no civilians living in it. In most of the cases, you can hardly find civilians with terrorists. They but, cannot leave. But the rough estimate, Mr. President, of the, of the total of 110,000 dead so far is at least about 50,000 civilians. You're saying there were 50,000 human shields? Uh, you're saying that, that those people no, no, were well, in the wrong first place? Of all, first of all, what's the source of your information? That is a breakdown by analysts who look at these numbers. Uh, you think it's lower? Uh, analysts from the United States, living in the United States, or living in Iran. The, you, you can only talk about facts. We cannot talk about estimations and allegations. 110,000 is a fact that everyone, everyone agrees well, with. Of course, as I said, I said we have tens of thousands of uh, uh, dead. I didn't say the exact number for one reason, because we have thousands of missing people. You cannot count them as dead. Did you know that they are dead? It's a war now. So talking about the number, we have to be very precise. You're talking about the numbers as spreadsheet, without uh, knowing that they are family, this is tragedy. We live with those people. We live with, this is a human tragedy. It's not about numbers. It's about every family in Syria lost a dear one, including my family. We lost a member of family, we lost friends, we lost, and this, uh, that's why we are fighting terrorism. 
So uh, should we uh, uh, allow the terrorists to continue without fighting them, this number, if it's close to the real number, will be so many falls, will be millions, not hundreds of thousands. We don't want to get lost in numbers because, as you say, it's very true, like a human issue here. But again, yeah, okay. you use the figure of 90% of the opposition, the rebels, are Al-Qaeda. You stand by that, 90%. 80 to 90, no one has exact number. You don't have the exact number because they are coming, flowing irregularly. You, you don't think that's too high. I mean, people are, are putting that lower, at least 50-50. And one would say that if at least it's 50-50, you have some opposition to Which deal with. Which people? I'm, I'm sure not the Syrian people. No one in Syria say they are 50-50. From abroad, maybe. They have their own estimations. But at the end, it's our conflict. We live here. It's our country. We can tell how, how much. But 50-50, how? How did they count it? But, but again, just to sum up of what you've been saying, in one quote, you said, the opposition has been manufactured from abroad. Do you really feel that? you really feel the opposition no, in this country not, to your it's, government it's, has been manufactured from abroad? It's not feeling, and it's not about my, how I feel. It's about what facts are presented in front of us. If they don't have Syrian grassroots, because we have oppositions in Syria that they have grassroots, why to have opposition abroad? Uh, how do they live? Who give them money? How they are financed? And we all know that they belong to some to the United States and Britain and France and Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Real opposition only belongs to the Syrian people. As long as it doesn't belong to these to its people, it's made by other countries. That's uh, simple evidence. Thank you. Yeah. Dennis. I, I just, I just uh, in listening to this exchange that you've had with Greg Palcott, there's one thing I want to be really sure about. Yeah. Are, are you minimizing the deaths by saying, well, you know, it's not 50,000, it's 40,000 or 30,000. No, are, you, are you minimizing? We cannot that? minimize it because in every house you have pain today. In every house you have sadness. You cannot minimize whether this number or higher number. It's a tragedy. We live in Syria. It's a killing. But uh, we have to talk about the reasons who killed those, not the government. The terrorists, we are defending our country. If we don't defend, this number will be manifold. That's what I, what I, what I meant. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Now, looking at a, at a broader picture here, uh, this is a watershed moment. It appears to be a watershed moment yeah. uh, that for the world, fr from here in war-torn Syria, uh, a new roadmap towards world peace may be developing uh, by starting with you relinquishing your chemical weapons mm -hmm. and then moving forward with a concrete plan for peace Mm -hmm. in Syria. Um, do, you, do you think that we are at that kind of a moment? Uh, you're talking about the situation within Syria. Uh, there's no direct relation between the chemical issue and uh, the conflict within Syria. It's completely different. So if we want to move toward a political solution, uh, we can, but uh, that's not related to the chemical agreement. I, I understand, but the fact that this chemical issue has brought the world together to yeah. finally pay attention. Is, is, this, is this a moment you can build from? That depends in, to a large extent to the countries that are supporting the terrorists in Syria. Before I go back to, to yeah. Greg, uh, there, there are a lot of countries now involved in this process. Yeah. Uh, not just the U.S. and Russia, but uh, Iran, Israel, Turkey, and, and uh, even China. So much depends on serious cooperation hmm. uh, with the Geneva process. Are, are you prepared to make sure that this opportunity doesn't fall apart? Uh, we supported Geneva process from the very beginning, and we cooperated with the UN envoys that came uh, to Syria. Actually, the one who put obstacles, not Syria, neither uh, Russia or China, it was the United States for many different reasons. One of the main reasons that they, do, they know that they don't have real oppositions abroad. They know this. This is one of their main problems because the core of Geneva uh, conference is to be based on the will of the Syrian people. So whatever we agreed in Geneva, up in Geneva, is going to be proposed to the Syrian people. And if you don't have grassroots, you cannot convince the Syrian people to move with you. This is the American problem with their puppets, to be very clear and very frank. Thank you, Mr. President. Greg? And following up on that, uh, Dennis and Mr. President, uh, others think indeed that, in fact, there is a way forward here, that you are, for the 
first time in this last two and a half years speaking seriously to the international community about a negotiating track, granted just a narrow track of chemical weapons. And in fact, there could be the possibility of longer range talks. Could you be a part of that? Or if your strong allies and basically the sponsor of this new wave of, uh, of discussions and negotiations, Russia, feels that perhaps it would be more helpful not to have you in the position. What would be your stand? Are, are you in this to the end, or if it's more, if it would facilitate things for you to step aside, and for the good of your country, would you do that as well? Being here or not being here in that position as president should be defined and decided by the Syrian people and by the ballot box. No one else, whether friend or uh, opponents or enemy or any other one, have a, a word in that uh, issue. Uh, if the Syrian people want you to be president, you have to stay. If they don't want you, you have to quit right away. Right away. With the, con with the conference or without a uh, conference. That's self-evident. We, we don't discuss it. And I, and I said it many times. So no one has to say that. And the Russian never tried to interfere in the, Syria, Syrian, in the Syrian matters. There's mutual respect between Syria and Russia, and they never try to involve themselves in those Syrian details. Only the American administration and their allies in Europe and some of the puppets in the Arab world repeat these words, whether the president should leave, uh, what the Syrian people should do, what kind of government. Only this bloc interfere in a sovereign, in the matter of sovereign country. I know you said uh, that there are elections scheduled here at least in 2014. Exactly. You, you would stand for those and you would see if uh, the people would decide for or against you and those could be conducted in this current atmosphere? You have to, to probe the mood of the people and the will and the desire of the people at that time to see whether they want to, to run for presidency or not. If they don't feel that they are positive, you don't run. So it's too early now because you have something new every day. Uh, it's too early to talk about it. Before the election, I can take my decision. Uh, Mr. President, according to the New York Times, President Obama has said the greater goal with respect to Syria is to curb chemical weapons use and proliferation of chemical weapons worldwide. Do you believe this could be a chance to reset Syria's relations with the United States? That depends on the credibility of the administration, any administration. And that depends on the U.S. administration's but you're not saying our president doesn't have credibility. You're, I'm asking you yeah. if, if this is an opportunity for you to reset relations with the yeah, United yeah, yeah. States. As I said, the relation depends on the credibility of the administration. We never looked at the United States as enemy. We never looked at the American people as enemy. We always like to have good relations with every country in the world. First of all, the United States, because it's the greatest country in the world. That's normal. That's self-evident. But that doesn't mean to, to say and to go in the direction that the United States want us to go in. We have our interest, we have our civilization, we have our will, uh, and we ha they have to accept and to respect that. Well, well, if there's mutual respect, we don't have problem. We want to have good relation, of course. L let me ask you some specifics with respect to going forward. Yeah. Uh, are you going to work towards a new constitution for Syria and guarantee more freedom for the people of Syria? Will you work towards that? Our constitution today guarantees more freedom. But that depends on, on the content of the freedom. That's what the Syrian parties could discuss on the table. It's not the constitution of the president. It's not my vision or my, uh, my own project. It should be a national project. So the Syrians should define exactly what they want, and I have to accept whatever they want. Well, well, what, well for example, what do you think of free elections? Of course, it, we have free elections now in this constitution. Really? Now we're going to have free elections ne uh, next year. In, in May uh, 2014. Is there anyone else who could be president of Syria? Of course, anyone who wants to be now, he can be. So, uh, so you're not the only person who could no, 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 I'm preside not, over no, Syria? No, no, I won't, be the, only, I won't, and, I won't uh, be the only person. And, and so you believe it's possible for Syria to have a peaceful transition uh, without you in power? That is possible. Uh, what do you mean by transition? Transition of what? A, a peaceful a transition of towards. What? a resolution of the conflict and the war, is that possible with you not being in power or do we have to end the war and then? If the Syrian people want me not to be in transitional or permanent or natural or normal situation, this means it's going to be peaceful. 
Anything people doesn't want, it cannot be peaceful. Um, let's look five years into the future. Yeah. Uh, what will Syria look like? Uh, we have so many challenges if we get rid of this conflict. Uh, of course, the, the, the shorter one is to, to get rid of the uh, terrorists, as I said. But the, the most important thing, their ideology. We have no doubt that the existence of terrorists from all over the world, extremist terrorists, have left so many side effects within the hearts and minds, at least, of the young people in Syria. What would you expect from a child who tried to behead somebody with his hand? What would you expect from children that's been watching beheading and barbecuing heads and watching cannibals in Syria on the TV and on the internet? I'm sure that it has a lot of psych psychological uh, uh, side effect and bad effects on the society. So we have to rehabilitate this generation uh, to be open again as Syria used uh, to be. Of course, I'm talking now about local focal, but if we leave it, it's going to be like a ripple in the water that expands into the society. This first. Second, we have to uh, uh, rebuild our infrastructure that has been destroyed recently, to rebuild our economy. And, as I said, to, to have a new system that suits the Syrian people, new political system and economic system and any other accessories regarding to these main, uh, main, he main headlines. Greg? Mr. President, as, as a reporter, I can just tell you what I see, and I've traveled around the country. I've seen uh, this crisis go on. Right now, looking as you do at your country, with maybe 60 to 70 percent of your territory out of your control, maybe 40 percent of your population out of your control, six million people displaced, almost a third of your country has been displaced by this war. We've talked about the death tolls. We haven't even mentioned those who are injured. Do you see any way back? Do you see any way that the people could again be behind you in a totality? Do you see anything that you could do at this point to make up for this two and a half years of hard, bloody, grinding war hmm. which this country has been put through? Uh, today, after the majority of the people experienced what the meaning of terrorism I'm talking about countries that used to be one of the safest in the world. We used to be number four in safety on the international scale. We were number four. To try to experience directly the extremism and the terrorism, those people wanted now to, they are supporting the government. So they are behind the government. doesn't matter if they, they are behind me. The most important thing is to be behind the institution. So the, you have the majority, yes. Regarding the uh, percentage that you put, it's, of course it's not correct, the percentage. But anyway, the army and the police don't exist anywhere in Syria. And the problem now is not a war between two countries and two armies that you say, I took that uh, land and I liberated the other land and so on. It's about the infiltration of the terrorism. Even if we liberate or get rid of terrorists in certain area, they'll go to another area and destroy and kill and behead and do, do their, their routine. The problem now is the infiltration of those terrorists to Syria and the most dangerous problem that we are facing, their ideology. This is more important than how much percent we have and how much percent they have. At the end, a large number of them are foreigners, they're not Syrians. They will leave someday or they'll be dead inside Syria. But it's about the ideology that they're, they're going to leave. This is the, the worry of Syria and the neighboring country. And this, is, and this should be the worry of any country in the world, including the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks. Uh, Mr. President, thank you uh, for this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Syria.